Thank you so much for joining us for LS Online. We're grateful that you're taking the time to stay caught up with the sermon series currently being taught at Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada. Although we're honored to be able to provide this online content, we want to make clear that this is not to replace your personal involvement in a local church in any way. So please use this service when you need to, but make it a priority to get plugged into a local gospel preaching church where you can worship, serve, and give as soon as possible. God bless you. Now please enjoy. Today marks the beginning of Advent. This is a season where we celebrate the approach of Christmas. Just like people waited for the approach of Jesus for thousands of years before he was born. We look forward to the celebration of Jesus' birth, but we also look forward to the return of Jesus, bringing his light to the world once again. For thousands of years, there were prophets who said that God was going to send a savior. All of these happened just as they were promised. So we know we can hope in God, who is always faithful to his promises. We declare the words of the scripture. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. We light the first candle that represents the prophets. Good morning, church. Merry Christmas. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Some of you are like, it's too early for that. Merry Christmas stuff. Would you please stand? We're gonna sing together. We're gonna sing a Christmas song. Philippians 4 says, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And so we're gonna rejoice because our God has made himself known. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing it out.
morning, Living Stones. It's good to be here with you guys. Welcome to the first week of Advent. Uh, if you're new or visiting, I want to extend you a special welcome. We're honored that you would come and join us today, Living Stones, to just uh, await and celebrate the birth of Jesus. Uh, our theme first for this Christian Christmas season, uh, Paul tells us that Jesus was manifested in the flesh, which is the whole reason why we celebrate at Christmas time, that God came to us in human form as a baby 2,000 years ago for the purpose of freeing us from slavery and sin. That is good news, isn't it? Amen. And next he says that he will be proclaimed among the nations. And family, today as we worship, that's our goal, to celebrate the reality that God has come to save us. And we're going to proclaim him here in Elko and throughout the world. Christians are proclaiming him among the nations. That's good news, right? Amen. Now, before we continue in worship, I just want to pray with you guys. So if you would bow your heads with me. God, we thank you for meeting us here today. God, we thank you that we have a reason to celebrate. God, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. God, we ask that our worship today would be glorifying to you. God, may all those distractions from outside be put away as we look towards the amazing truth that you have come for us and that you are with us. God, be with us as we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we get back to worship, we've acknowledged through song and prayer that we're in the presence of God. We need to acknowledge that we're in the presence of one another. So if you would, turn to somebody next to you and welcome them to Living Stones. Back to your seats, remain standing. We're going to sing together.
God, we thank you that we have been redeemed by you, that you have come for us in our need. And I pray that today we will rejoice in that truth. Emmanuel, God with us. So God, give us peace in this time. Give us peace in this season. God, go before us now. In Jesus' name, in all God's people said. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. We've got a couple of important announcements for you today, starting with this. We are getting ready to celebrate our Christmas services on December 18th at the convention center uh, at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you guys came to last year's Christmas services for Living Stones? Wow, like half of you, that's it? Well, the rest of y'all are in for a treat then, because uh, guys, how was it? There it was. It was amazing. See, this is an easy gimme for Christians. I don't know if you know this, but nine out of 10 people, if invited to a Christmas service, will absolutely come with you. It's crazy. It's like they're insane. They normally will just tell you no and put you off and make excuses. But around Christmas, you invite them in and they'll come. Living Stones wants to give you a great opportunity to make that happen. And so we do so every year with our citywide Christmas celebration. Last year, we celebrated with over 1,200 people from Elko. That's a pretty big deal, right? That's like double or triple the size of our church normally. So that's something to be uh, praising God about. We're hoping that even more people get to hear the gospel this year. So our hope for you is that as you guys go out today, you'll be considering who it is that you will invite to our Christmas services. There's a couple of more things as you consider that. The first is that we are going to uh, actually do seating this year. So the reality is last year, we turned people away at the door for our 4 p.m. service, and we're not okay with that. There are 750 chairs. There's no reason why we can't all have a seat. So what we're asking you guys to do is head on over to the uh, LS Elko Facebook page. There's a post on there right now, and you can reserve your seats for the December 18th service, uh, services. I want to recommend that you do that. There's also a second forum that allows you to uh, register your children for LS Kids. If you've got kids from zero to five, uh, I want to encourage you to jump on that today so that you can mark your seats. If you invite somebody to come with you, mark their seats for them. Make sure they can sit right next to you. We're really excited to celebrate this, but we don't want to turn people away anymore. We want to make sure that there's a seat for everyone. So jump on out there and get that going. It's going to be amazing this year. We've done some things this year that we have never done before, and we're excited to invite you guys all into that. December 18th, 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Now, uh, also this year, we've got year in gift, but we've got some other people that want to talk to you about that. So if you would, first turn your attention to the screen behind me, and we'll let you know about that. When did I forget what this has always been about? Maybe Christmas doesn't need to be different, but I need to be different. So here's what I'm gonna do. The wife and I sat down. We decided to spend less anxiety, energy, and money, and instead give more relationally, like how God gave his son. Some of you we see all the time. So we thought about the gifts that could make that time more meaningful together. Others of you we don't see as often. So we wanted to make something with a bit of heart. We tried lots of things. And then we found out from a friend that you can roast your own coffee beans with a popcorn popper. So our family is making gifts with some personal notes and prayers. If the love of Jesus changed the world, what if, in celebration of that, we took a portion of what we used to spend on gifts for each other and instead gave a lasting gift to those in need? I know what you're thinking. Where do you even start? Well, how about here? Did you know that every minute a child dies from a water-related disease? What if we could give someone the gift of clean drinking water? I know, alone, our small gift doesn't seem huge. But the story of Christmas is that we're not alone. And if we all gave together, all of a sudden it's not so small anymore. And that's a Christmas story that I'd like to be a part of, and one we would all remember. So dear friends and family, who's ready for that Christmas? I know we are, and we're inviting you to join us.
Well, hey, everybody. <laughs> my name is Lissa. This is my husband, Mitch. And uh, this last August, we uh, were given the incredible opportunity to go to Guatemala and partner with other Living Stones churches and Living Water International to help dig a freshwater well for a little community in need out there. Now, uh, um, we went to this little place called Tiki Sate, which is about 30 miles from the Pacific coast. Now, Tiki Sate itself is about 30,000 people. Um, and the traffic was crazy. And the little community that we went to was in a little church about 10 miles out of town. And so we had to drive this incredibly bumpy road to get out there, make sure that your bladder was empty before you left. <laughs> and so uh, when we got to the community, um, it was actually on church property that this well was supposed to go into. Now, uh, um, this little church had been wanting a well on property for years and years and years. And they kept saying, no, there's no aquifers. There's too many rocks in the way. There's, there's just no water. It's not a possibility, but they kept praying. They kept seeking the Lord. They kept asking, kept asking. So finally living water went out there and they surveyed it and they said, okay, well, let's give it a go. Let's try. And so uh, we went out there and um, they got everything set up and long story short, guys, we hit water the first day. First day. Now, our team lead from Living Water International, Rudy, said, God literally moved rocks. There is no way that we should have been able to hit water where we hit water. But God had a plan for this community. And we were able to witness a true miracle hitting water the first day. Now, when I went out there, um, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. They tell us not to go in with expectations. But let's be real you're always going to have expectations going into something like this. And so I knew I didn't speak the language well. I really didn't know how the whole thing was going to work. And so I was super nervous. But when we got out there, we met these beautiful people. They opened their hearts and their homes and uh, their space to us. Um, they were so grateful that that we were there and um, they were so hospitable and so generous out of the very little that they had, they gave so much. They took such good care of us. They fed us a home cooked meal every, uh, every lunch um, from the chickens running around <laughs> the yard. And so, uh, but we were just treated so well. And, and um, these people knew uh, they, were, they were part of the church. So they were, they were fellow believers. And so they knew that this well was not only going to um, service their church and that family, but also the hundred families that lived in the area that didn't know Jesus. And so it gave them an opportunity to be able to share not only the truth of the gospel, but water that is going to save lives, literal lives. And so they were so excited about having us there, partnering with us to be able to, to dig this well in order to proclaim among the nations that God is good. And so I just wanted to thank you guys all so much for supporting us, not only with your prayers, but also for your finances. It was such a blessing that we were able to go out and you guys played such an important part in changing the lives of this beautiful community. Yeah. So like Lisa said, uh, we are just blessed to, to go out there and, and, uh, dig this well. But, um, my first thing too, is I just wanted to be, I expected to hit water. I just wanted to get busy and work. I thought that's where I'd feel most comfortable. Um, but when we get there, we go on this little tour and we take this bumpy road down through the village and, um, they live way different than we do. <laughs> There's, uh, a lot of houses that were just, it looked like something that I built with, with my friends in my backyard. It was just like some plywood and, and maybe a tin roof that was rusting in. Um, so, uh, and usually have a multi-generational family, uh, in that house. So, uh, that was, that was a reality check for me. Uh, the need was great. Um, and, uh, they really didn't need me to, to dig a well. It's Rudy, our team lead was was awesome. He uh, he said, "Here's a shovel. Here's what you do. You do this and that." And we rotated through. That was the easy part. And let's be honest, I was there just to play with the kids most of the time. Uh, so uh, I definitely uh, had my hands full with that too. But um, the people were awesome, and uh, yeah. So that's uh, <laughs> that's probably me not working. Um, but uh, <laughs> so just across from the church is this 
is where water is. There's about a, a ditch. It's about probably 30 feet below the church on this really bumpy road that's bumpy because there's so many rocks in it. And uh, we, you look out there, and that's where a lot of these villagers would go to get water. And, and um, as, as it's a rainy season, there's just rain and rain and rain, and, and there's, like, there's like raw sewage, and there's, there's uh, problems with pesticides and stuff from, from the farms around. And I mean, that's for those kids. I can't imagine sending my kids to, hey, go get water uh, there. Um, so the, the ones that were lucky enough to have um, the ability to dig a little bit, uh, that water still wasn't, wasn't any good. So we, we dug the deepest, I think, of, of any 300 feet. Uh, they have over 100 foot of water in the aquifer that we found. And uh, it, was, it was awesome. So um, the community was great to us. But you just have to think, uh, you guys sent us, and every time uh, someone pumps that handle, uh, not only are you giving living water, but they're hearing the word. Uh, it's on a church site, and, and pastor's doing well. So I appreciate you. Thank you for sending us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Adeline, and I'm the local outreach director here. And as you just saw on the opening video and heard from Lissa and Mitch, at Living Stones, we are really passionate about ensuring that people around the world have access to fresh, clean drinking water. So for the past 13 years, Living Stones Church has partnered with Living Water International during our year in gift. And every year during Christmas, we challenge our church to spend less on ourselves and to give more to others. So during our year in gift, we make an offering that's in addition to our regular ties, 50% which goes to the local missions and outreach, and the other 15% goes direct, 50, sorry, the other 50% goes directly to Living Water International. So last year, the family of Living Stones Churches gave over $156,000 to Living Water International. Yeah. That's amazing, and it provided 15 water wells across nine countries. So, Last year, our goal for the, our year-end gift was to raise $40,000. You guys brought in over $70,000, almost doubling what we asked. So this year, our goal is to beat that. And our challenge for you is simple. Each year, the average American spends $100 per person on, on their household on bottled water. So we are asking that if you are new to Living Stones or have never participated in our year-end gift, that you would consider giving $100 to our year-end gift project this year. If you don't think that can make a difference, your $100 will provide fresh, clean drinking water for a family of five for life. For those of you who have participated in Year and Gift, please consider giving $100 per person in your household to our Year and Gift this year. If you think about it, the amount of money that you spend on bottled water in your household for one whole year will provide safe, clean drinking water for up to five families for their entire life. And for those of you that God has blessed richly, would you consider giving $100 per person in your household per week of Advent? This will change countless lives. So church, during the offering, there will be an opportunity for you to give to our year-end gift. And I want to remind you that any gift given is above and beyond your regular tithes and offerings. So let's do good this year and provide water and the living water, which is the gospel, to people around the world. We can do this. Thank you. That is really incredibly exciting what we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, I was especially blown away when she said 15 wells in nine countries. You have helped with that. This church, Living Stones Elko, if you feel like you just live in a little corner in the middle of nowhere, you are actually having a global impact for both the gospel and for people's health and well-being. So thank you guys so much for your participation over the years. I hope that you'll be praying about what it is that you'll do uh, over the next month. Now, we need to read scripture together. Um, so if you would, would you grab your phone? Would you grab uh, either maybe one of these Bibles that are placed around the room or grab your Bible and stand with me for the reading of God's word? Today, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
And we're going to read verse 16, but before we do, I've got a couple of things for you. If you're kind of new here and you're wondering why we're doing this, why we stand, uh, the truth is we believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe that God has revealed himself to us through his word. And so we stand out of reverence for what he has done for us when we read it together. We'll do that pretty much forever at this church. The other thing you should know if you are either new here or you don't have a Bible, if you're using one of these black ones, take it home with you. This is a great opportunity for you to just get your own Bible. We're happy to give that to you. The people of Living Stones give generously so that you can have that. And the third thing I'm going to let you know is that uh, we have a special guest speaker today. His name is John. He's from Ireland. So if you brought your Irish translation Bible, that is probably the best one that you could have so that you can prepare yourself to understand what he's saying. Uh, but uh, if you haven't, the one thing is, is he's kind of energetic. So I want to encourage you all, like you guys can participate a little bit, all right? A little bit of uh, amens and yes, that sort of thing. It's okay to do that in church, right? I promise no one's going to yell at you. All right. Hallelujah. First Timothy, there it is. <laughs> First Timothy chapter three, verse 16 says this. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. This is the word of the Lord. You guys can grab a seat. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Morning, Living Stones. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thank you so much for, uh, even after the busyness of Thanksgiving week, uh, coming here this morning to kick off the Christmas celebration with us. Uh, to those of you who are new or visiting, I've already met some of you. It's your first time today. Thank you for being here. My name's Nathan Hornback, and uh, I'm the lead pastor for Living Stones here in Elko. Uh, typically, what that means is I have the honor of, of being the primary preacher of God's Word. Uh, but today, uh, you guys are in for a treat because we have my friend, Pastor John Irvine, all the way from across ye old pond. <laughs> See, so don't say I never tried no, you anything. You don't okay? try. Uh, all the <laughs> Talk to me after. Um, all the way from Ireland. Now, uh, something just cool that you guys should know, uh, Pastor John and I actually got connected five years ago. Uh, because one of the other pastors in the Living Stones Network met him, found out he yeah. was doing church planting in a rural uh, city in Northern Ireland and said, hey, we have a guy at Living Stones who's planting in a rural part of Nevada in Elko. And uh, it'd be cool if you guys talked. And so one tweet later, um, <laughs> here he is later. launching our fourth <laughs> Advent yeah. series uh, here in Elko, Nevada, all the way from Ireland. Now, mm -hmm. the real reason he comes is because he likes Thanksgiving. Absolutely. And they don't get Thanksgiving. <laughs> and so he likes to come here and eat all week long Yep. Uh, and then kick off our Christmas series. And so I'm so excited to have him here. He has become a dear friend yeah. all the way across the pond, and I'm just so thankful for what God's doing through him, through Cornerstone Church, for their baptisms, for what they're doing in their community. And uh, I'm just honored uh, to have him here with, with all of us. And so with that said, if you guys would, I want to pray over him and for us. Uh, if you feel comfortable, if you go ahead and just raise a hand toward him. Uh, if you're new or visiting, this is not, this doesn't make anything magical. It doesn't make our prayers special. It's just us uh, outwardly agreeing that we're lifting up Pastor John. So if you would do that now, Let's pray for him. Uh, God, thank you so much uh, for my brother, John. Thank you, God, for saving your sons and daughters all the way across the ocean Amen. on the island of Ireland. Thank you, God, for saving John, yeah. his family, his kids. Thank you for the baptisms they're seeing in their church. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that's all yeah. over him. Uh, God, it's amazing because only Jesus and what he's done can take complete strangers from a world away and make them family. And so, God, I just pray that you would fill him with your spirit as he preaches your word to us, that we would, we would see uh, the beauty yeah. of Jesus, yeah. 
and that lives would be changed forever. We love you. Fill John with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning here at Living Stones in Elko. Uh, we're going to have to do some work before I begin, right? So who, I, I always ask the question when I come here, who hasn't heard me or who has? So I'm going to ask the question this morning, who hasn't heard me preach before? Oh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot. You are in for a treat. Because it's like, it's like preaching in tongues, only different. Uh, and so we, we rely fully on the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning to do only what he can and take my words, which will make no sense to you, and uh, take them and, and, and put them in our hearts this morning. Uh, so I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you to encourage me and nod and smile and do all the things you would normally do, even if you don't understand, okay? That's what I need you to do this morning. So, first of all, I want to thank your leaders. Uh, I want to thank your leaders for, for just giving me the opportunity to be here again. Uh, as Nathan said, we partnered together five years ago, and our official partnership ended three years ago, and here I am. <laughs> uh, we are gen all your leaders. All, they have been so gracious, so kind, and, and I love them. I love them. And this is what I can tell you about them. They love you. They love you. They love you as a church. But more importantly, they love Jesus. They love Jesus. Their love for Jesus, I'm getting emotional. I'm an emotional guy. So <laughs> their love for Jesus is infectious. And I'm praying for you and I'm praying for them. Uh, as I just hear about wonderful things that are happening here in Alco through those guys. And God is using this church to bring many people to himself. So praise God for that. A uh, couple of things. I want to I point you in the direction this morning of the Irish tree that is in the foyer. Uh, the, the, the art guys here have done a fantastic job and they will do a fantastic job over the next few weeks of decorating a different tree from a different area that they have supported. And I am privileged that they have an Irish tree out there. Engage with that. There's a little bit of a testimony just about things that have been happening in Ireland over the last year. Engage with that. Look at that. On there, you'll find some cool stuff from Ireland. There is a, a decoration of the Harland and Wolf crane that was used to build Titanic uh, all the way from Ireland. So that's, that's out there. I love the way, right? I love the way we Irish take great pride in building the unsinkable ship that sank. <laughs> Score. Yeah. Yeah. That's us. That's, if, if you want a synopsis of what the Irish are, that's it. That's, that's it. We, we take great pride in, in building stuff that sinks. Okay, right. So what we're going to do today is spend some time in those, those first, those first, that first line of the text that we read, that God read for us today. And it's this. He was manifested in the flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. R.T. France, a theologian, said this, most people's awareness of the Christmas story is derived mainly from school nativity plays in which Luke's tea towel shepherds rub shoulders with Matthew's magi promoted to royal status and surely the innkeeper and his wife are surrounded by infant angels with tinsel halos. Add to this cocktail an array of Christmas cards depicting a glowing stable surrounded by bleak midwinter snow and populated by smiling ox and ass. And you have the ingredients for the satisfying feel-good schmaltzfest that is the modern Christmas. And I enjoy it as much as anyone. I would agree. Most of our thoughts, most of what we believe can often come from what we've seen in nativity scenes. It's been informed by that or hijacked by that. 
And what I want to do this morning is actually look at what the Bible says about the incarnation, about Jesus coming to earth, about him being manifest in the flesh. You see, we tend to over-romanticize it or idealize it. But one of the first things you read about Jesus when he, in the story of Jesus coming to earth is this. Jesus came from brokenness to heal brokenness. So to, so to debunk the myth of romanticism, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at where Jesus came from in an earthly sense. The truth is, Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. He came from a dysfunctional family line. When the angel tells Joseph to name the baby Jesus because he will save people from their sins, this is undoubtedly a glance backward at his family line. If you look at the genealogy, the family tree in Matthew, what you'll see is a list of undesirables. A list of undesirables. What's even more intriguing is that there are five women included in that genealogy. You see, the reality is it was rare, if not, not even heard of, that women would be included in a Jewish genealogy. And it's not the women we might expect. It is, it's not Sarah or Rebecca. No, we get Tamar. Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. All of those have some past connection with sexual immorality. Tamar seduced her father-in-law. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was part of the Moabite tribe who was involved in incest. Every single one, the, 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 the child born to Uriah was conceived as a result of an adulterous relationship with King David. And all of them had Gentile connections as well. You see, we encounter a theme that runs through the gospel story of Jesus coming to earth, and it's this, the expansion of his people to even the Gentiles. But the main thing we see through the genealogy of Jesus is this, that there is no one that, that can be excluded. No one that can be on the outside because of something they have done or because of the family line they come from. No one. Scott Saul's pastor said this, it was the crooks and the prostitutes, the lepers and the homeless, the materially poor, not the proud, not the self-sufficient, not the prestigious scribes and Pharisees who felt most at home in Christ's kingdom. And maybe, just maybe, that's because that's what he came from. That's what Jesus came from. Now, what we do when we hear that is we can all put a big thumbs up to that. We can all say, yes, we know the, the Pharisees are the bad guys and the, and, the, and the underdog are the good guys, and we can say that. But, but what in a, in a room like this, I imagine we come from all across the spectrum. There are some people in here who, if I was saying this back home, would say that they are from good stock, a good family line. And the gospel says, don't take pride in that. Don't rely on that. Rely on Christ. And there are those in here this morning who are ashamed. Those in here this morning who feel the weight of coming from a dysfunctional family. The gospel says, don't concern yourself about that. Concern yourself with Christ. Concern yourself with Christ. And so what I wanted to do, just to set this up this morning, just to set up the incarnation, is to say this. Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. This is how he came. This is the way that he came. This is the way that cho God chose to make his son manifest in the flesh. Be encouraged by this this morning. 
So, who came? We know how he came. We know that he came from an earthly family that was dysfunctional. But who came? Who are we talking about when we're talking about him being manifest in the flesh? Well, we're talking about none other than God. God being manifest in the flesh. In Matthew 1, you see, we've, we've heard it several times this morning, and I love the way, I genuinely love the way the Holy Spirit does these things. We've heard it several times this morning already. Emmanuel, God with us. We see in Matthew, that's one of the names given to Jesus. And the incarnation, it, is, it sums up the incarnation beautifully. God with us. And what I want to do this morning for the rest of our time is just explore those three beautiful words, God with us. To have God with us, to have him manifest in the flesh. You see, God is with us. It's who Jesus is. He came on that first Christmas to bring God into the range of our experience. Christmas is not this perfect day where everything must be right. Everything has to be right. No, it is a day remembering God gave himself to us in our weakness and our failings and our disappointments. So let's just savor these three words this morning. God with us. So first of all, who? God. God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism of 1648, that's a long time ago. Uh, it says this, what is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Folks, that is who is with us. That's who's with us. Spirit makes him unlimited, eternal, means that he was here before the foundations of the earth and he will be here forever. Unchangeable means he's never moody or erratic. Wisdom, smarter than all of us put together. And I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> Power, he never gets tired. Holiness, he's pure, he's unmixed. Justice, all his ways are pure and right. Goodness, there's nothing to worry about in him. Truth, he is blunt, but not rude. Folks, God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, that's who's with us. That's who's with us. There's a story told about Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther, who was, uh, I love this word, belly aching. Do you, under, yeah, you get that? Yeah. I don't know what the, the, uh, is, the American equivalent would be. Uh, in Irish, it would be yapping. But uh, he, Martin Luther was belly aching about his terrible life, about how things were going so wrong, about his God forsaken life. So his wife, Catherine, came downstairs one day in a black funeral dress. And he asked her, who has died? Catherine's response, apparently God, and I'm just joining you in the morning. <laughs> her aim, you see, was to stop Luther from going in the crazy, forgetting God was with him. You see, we live in a world, folks, which where everywhere present is an almighty God who loves to stick up for people who don't deserve it. Everywhere. Folks, let's correct our thoughts today of who is with us. God is with us. We're doing a, a series at the moment in Cornerstone in Revelation. And this is what Revelation 20 says about the God that is with us. And I saw a great white throne and God was seated on it. And the earth and the sky fled from his presence. Folks, 
we have the God of the universe with us. The God who created all things with us. Think of the images of God that we have in scripture. King, shepherd, warrior, rock, refuge, shield, father, maker, judge, lawgiver, comforter, savior, lion, lamb, many more. That's who is with us. God is with us. Let's correct our thoughts this morning about who exactly is with us. The God of all creation. So God, who's with us? God. What is he? With He is with. He is not against us. In fact, he is so with us that there is not one moment when his eyes turn from us. There is not one moment that his heart gets weary of us. He hears our cries. He sees our need. He knows our sin. And he is with us. The withness of God means that he is our ally in the war. Matthew, when when he when he is saying this name, Emmanuel, God with us, is quoting from an Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And in the context that he is quoting from, it is in the context of military conflict. And so when God says he is with us, what he is saying is this, whatever battle we are in, he is going with us. Whatever crisis we face, we have a savior to fight for us. Supremely, ultimately, our ultimate crisis, folks, is our sin. Supremely, our ultimate Battle is our sin, and we have a God who fought for us. When sin and death and hell rose up against us, Jesus defeated it on our behalf. We have a Savior who says, I am with you. Not, I am with you as long as you stay good enough. No. Not a savior who says, I'm with you if you do X, Y, and Z. No, a savior who says, I am with you no matter what. No matter what. He is with us. He is not against us. God fights for us. You see, God gets personally involved. Every time we see the word himself in the Bible, our ears should perk up because he himself is going to do something. Let me give you an example from 1 Peter. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The reality is, folks, God could summon a thousand angels at any moment to do anything for you. But he doesn't. He does it himself. Himself. Here's another. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16. And another, the Lord himself will descend from heaven and the dead will cry, and the dead in Christ will rise. First Thessalonians. God gets personally involved. The God that we just described, the God that, is, that we described there when I was talking about just who Jesus is, he gets personally involved. And see the incarnation, what we're talking about here when we're talking about he was manifest in the flesh is crucial to the witness of God with us. Think about the age that you and I live in. I believe that we live in probably what, it's only my opinion, but I believe that we live in the most privileged age throughout history. Think about the Old Testament. God wasn't with his people the way he is now. 
For, for the Old Testament people, they had to go to the temple where the presence of God was. For the priests were only allowed access to certain parts. The, the great high priest was only allowed access into the most holy place where God dwelt. That is not the case for us. That is not the case for us. We live in this age because of the gospel, because Jesus came in the incarnation, because he was made manifest in the flesh, because he lived the life that you and I couldn't live, because he died the death that you and I deserve, because he rose to to guarantee our resurrection. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and he sent the Holy Spirit in which we, we believe dwells in God's people. Folks, when we come in here this morning, we don't need to ask God to be here. Are you with me? We don't need to cajole him to be here. We don't need to uh, do some incantation to, to, to get him to hear. No, because if you're a believer in Christ, when you walk through that door, he's here. He's here. God is with us. No one needs to invite him. No one needs to cajole him. If you're in Christ, he is with you. He's here. He's with us. He gets fully involved. So Jesus entering into the world is the ultimate demonstration of God being with us. He's not far off. He is fully invested, fully present. Folks, that is good news for us. That is good news for us in a world that it seems to be crazy. God is with us. So God, the person of Christ Jesus, is fully God. We're told that in scripture. He is fully God, fully man. He is with, he gets personally involved in the details of your life. He is for you if you're in Christ. He is not against you. But there's one little small word at the end of that beautiful name that is crucial. God with us. Us. Folks, this is amazing. Because if I was to ask you Who of us in this room thinks we deserve that? I guarantee you almost, no one would say we deserve for God to be with us. But he is. You see, all too often, we think that God might smile on others, but not on me. All too often, we think, I'm left out, and it's probably my fault. That's how we think, these dark fears that we have within us. But the reality is different. The reality, the truth is this. We messed up as we are. Messed up human beings with broken lives, as messed up as we are, we matter to the King of Kings. We matter to God. God treasures us. God rejoices over us for Jesus' sake. And to prove his point, he came down into this world to be with us. He comes down to be with us today. You see, we started off with Emmanuel, God with us. That's at the beginning of Matthew. Jesus, just before he ascends to the the right hand of the Father in Matthew 28 says this, behold, I am with you always, always, even to the end of the age. So that first Christmas story, so long, long ago, Christmas keeps happening on repeat every single day of our lives if we're in Christ Jesus. Behold, I am with you always. It's not just once a year. 
but every single day God is drawing near to you. And what all of us should love is that God is not just with the individual, but he is with you as a church. He's not just with the big important people. He's with us mere mortals. He's not just with the cool people. I don't know if there are any cool people in this church, are there? Your leaders certainly are not. Uh, He's not just with the important people. He's not just with the cool people. He's with us. And he made a promise in Hebrews 13. And I want you to take this promise. And this is what the incarnation means, folks. He said, if you're in Christ, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. That is the beauty of Jesus coming to earth, being made manifest in the flesh, is that he said he would never leave us. I love, the, I love what the disciples asked. They were like, oh, why do you have to go away? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, it is better that I go away, that I send the Spirit so that he is with you always. Folks, the, re- the reality of this Christmas season is this. We have God with us. No matter what you take out into it tomorrow, I, I know I, like in a room this size, Tomorrow, you may have fears, you may have worries, you may have concerns. There could be health issues, there could be family issues, there could be any number of issues that you will take out of this building into today, tomorrow, to next week. I want you to know that if you're in Christ, God, the God that we described, the God who is the maker of all things is with you. You with me? Amen. But maybe you don't know God with you. Maybe you don't know the reality of the incarnation. I want to ask you today, why not? I want to ask you if you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus, why not? Do you realize the difference the incarnation can make to you? Do you realize that all you're hoping for, all you're living for, all you want, all that you could ever dream of is fulfilled in those three small words, God with us. I want to ask you today, just repent. Repent and turn to Jesus. Make this Christmas special. Make this Christmas the most special Christmas that you could ever have by coming to King Jesus and knowing, knowing that he is with you. There is no other peace like that. So if you're in here this morning and you don't know peace, you're wrestling with things and you wanna know Jesus, grab Nathan, grab one of the other leaders, speak to me, do whatever you need to do today to come to Jesus and know the reality of God with you. God with you. Folks, Malcolm Muggeridge said this, let us then as Christians rejoice. And can I just say this Christmas season, I hope you do rejoice and I thank you. I, can, I, can I just thank you for your patience with me? Uh, I would love to know afterwards if you got 70%, 50%, 20% of what I said, uh, just so that I can, you know, for next year. <laughs> so, so I can so I can go home and, 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 and practice my American accent a little bit more. That's not going to happen. That's not, that's not going to happen. But let us as Christians rejoice that we see around us on every hand. Folks, this is, this is gold. The decay of the institutions of power, empires falling to pieces, money in total disarray, dictators and parliamentarians alike perplexed by the confusion and the conflicts which encompass them. For it is precisely when every earthly hope has been explored and found lacking. And in the gathering darkness, every glimmer of light has finally flickered out. It is then that Christ's hand reaches out 
sure and firm. Then Christ's words bring inexpressible comfort. Then his light shines the brightest, abolishing darkness forever. God with us. Let me pray for us, folks. Father, we thank you so much that you have, in your eternal wisdom, sent Jesus in the flesh to be with us. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that we don't need to ask, we don't need to cajole, you're here. Father, help us to realize that. I pray for these dear folks today. I pray that every single one would leave this building knowing the reality of the God of heaven being with them. Encourage them. Send them out rejoicing. Send them out praising the name of Jesus today. And we pray all this in his beautiful name. And it is all for his glory. Amen. Amen. Good job, man. Family, each week after the sermon, we like to create some time for confession. And there are many different types of confession. There's confession of sin, confession of need, uh, confession of desire. There are all these things, but today, after hearing the beauty that is God with us, I think it's just appropriate that we would confess our need for that God. So today, for the next few moments, I'd like you to just bow your heads and take a moment and confess your need for Jesus. Confess your need for him to save you, to redeem you, to be with you. Let's do that now. Church, Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call out to him in truth. The truth today is, family, that if you have called out to Jesus, if you had confessed your need for Jesus in truth, then he is with you. Then that good news that we heard John preach today, God is with us and he is with you. How incredible is that news, family? I need that every day. I hope that you never forget that. We need him, but when we call out to him, he is near to us. Amen. And each week we celebrate this truth, this reality by taking communion together. God gave us the gift of this meal, the taking of the juice and the bread to remind us of his goodness and his grace to us until he returns for us. And so Christians in the room, I hope that you begin to prepare your hearts at this time. This isn't just another religious rite. This is a reminder of who you belong to. This is a reminder of what Jesus has done for you, his blood shed and his body broken on your behalf so that he could live and dwell amongst his people. That's incredible news. And so at this time, Christian, this would be a great opportunity for you to just um, maybe confess sin. Maybe put aside anything that would keep you from coming to the table with joy and excitement for what he's done on your behalf. And if you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, I want to free you from taking this meal at all. The truth is that the people around you who are taking communion, they're confessing that Jesus is Lord. They're confessing that their life and their entire existence is tied up with him. And if you're not ready to say that, it's okay. You can come to Living Stones as long as you want but I recommend that you just let those plates slide until you're ready to say, I need Jesus and I want Jesus. Family, let's take communion together. Let's remember as we look forward to the birth of Jesus, let's remember what he has already done for us, even as we await the celebration of his birth. I'm gonna pray and then let's take communion. God, we thank you for this reminder. We thank you that we get to participate in it. God, thank you that you are near to us. Be near to us as we celebrate this communion together. God, would you commune with us as we reach out to you? God, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.
Family, let's take communion together. Now in a few moments, we're going to take some time to worship God with our tithes and offerings. Now, as always, this is in response to the gift that God has given us. We take what he has blessed us with and we give back. That's the ultimate goal of worshiping God with our tithes and offerings. But before we do that, I wanted to share something with you from 2 Corinthians 9, 11. It says, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. Did you guys notice those themes in there? Your generosity actually produces thanksgiving to God, both in you and in others who see your generosity. Not only does it supply for the needs of others, it overflows into these expressions of thanks to God. Consider this, people will actually glorify God for your obedience and your generosity. That's what scripture says. So I want to encourage you today, as you look at how you will worship God, I want you to keep that in mind. You're producing thanksgiving in your heart, which seems a little apropos, right? And we just celebrate how grateful we are for what we have. This is our opportunity to show God how grateful we are for what he has done. And our last thing I'll say is year in gift starts today. So my hope is that throughout this year, you have been praying about how you will bless others, maybe spend less on yourself and give more. Uh, if you would like to do that today, just keep in mind that that's above and beyond your general tithes and offerings. It's amazing that we get to do this incredible work, but if we can't meet here because we've given everything that we have to drill wells, then how can we drill more wells? <laughs> this is the truth of it. And so I want to encourage you, Worship God with your tithes and offerings. Make a generous gift to your in gift and literally be a part of changing the world. I'm gonna pray for our offering this morning and then we're gonna receive it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to participate in your mission. God, thank you so much for saving us. God, thank you for, that you are with us. God, help us to respond in generosity to what you have done through your son. In 
Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive our offering. Church, if you're ready, go ahead and stand. We're going to sing.
good celebrating the first week of Advent with you guys. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for worshiping aloud. Thank you for remembering to keep uh, Sunday a time where we worship God together. Before you guys leave, uh, we want you to hang out. There's going to be pastors up here to pray for you if that's what you need. But if you do have children, would you please pick them up first before you hang out? Uh, our teachers are resetting those classrooms for the next, uh, next set of kids, and we just want to make sure that they've got plenty of time to do that. There will be leaders up here praying and in missional sending, which is just something to take with you as you go. We just heard today that God is with us. Others need to hear that news. I want to encourage you to grab an invite card on your way out the door and actually put a name on it. You don't have to write it on there, but it should be on your mind who this is going to. They need to hear that God is with them. Amen. Now in benediction, may God bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you rest and peace in this season. But may you remember that he is good and he is with you. Go in peace, family. You guys are all dismissed. Have a great week. Amen. Good job, bro. Come and stand amazed, you people. See how God is reconciled. See his plans of love accomplished. See his gift, this newborn child.